Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm an old school flashcards kind of person, so please excuse me. Um, so yes, I'm here to talk about mental health. Um, so before I start, I just want to introduce myself and what we do as an organisation. So uh, Rare Minds is a community interest company, which is a sort of term that encompasses kind of a social enterprise. And we established in 2020 to provide specialist mental health services for the rare disease community. We also deliver workshops, provide training, and undertake research to raise awareness. So we believe that we're the only third sector organisation in the UK and possibly worldwide specifically focusing in this area. And our focus comes from our belief that those living with rare conditions are a unique population with unique needs that are, oh, <laughs> sorry, I just, yep, that are often not addressed uh, or understood by other services. Many of us in the clinical team also have lived experience of rare conditions. So Rare Minds delivers specialist counselling by partnering with patient organisations and assigning members of the clinical team to work with these organisations throughout the partnership. What this allows is us as counsellors to gain a greater understanding of the unique challenges of a particular condition and create strong relationships. So I'm here today to talk about the impact of an NF diagnosis because I'm part of the team working with the Childhood Tumour Trust, providing support to adults, couples and young people over the age of 14 living with NF1. And we support patients and parents. I do want to acknowledge that our work with CTT means our understanding is greater for NF1, and obviously uh, all conditions are represented today. However, there are commonalities that can be found across NF diagnoses, just as there can be differences in individual experiences within each diagnosis. I also want to acknowledge that mental health is such a broad topic and that there is so much to cover that today's talk will necessarily be fairly limited. However, my hope is that you'll hear some things that will resonate with you and that you'll be able to take away some tips on how to manage the difficult stuff. I will also be signposting to sources of support. Unfortunately, many of these, or most of these, are UK-specific, so I apologise for our sort of European um, friends. So, we know from experience that living with a rare condition is emotionally demanding. But to put this into context, I just wanted to share some of the statistics from the Rare Disease UK 2018 study. So Rare Disease UK conducted a survey of 1,300 patients and carers, and here are some of the results that they found. 95% reported feeling worried or anxious. 93% reported feeling stressed. 90% felt low. 88% felt emotionally exhausted. And 70% felt a breaking point. Now, this is not to alarm you, but to say that if at any point you have felt that you might have struggled, please remember that you're not alone. In fact, an NF study from 2012 found that there were higher levels of anxiety and depression and lower self-esteem compared to general population norms within NF. So what is it about a rare disease diagnosis that impacts our emotional well-being? I think it all starts with the diagnostic odyssey, and many of you might be familiar with this term, which sort of represents the arduous journey to even get a diagnosis. This might have involved many appointments with healthcare professionals, uh, social services, um, and perhaps experiences of not being believed, fighting to be heard. All of these contribute to a sense of, of stress and struggle. And unfortunately, the fighting does not necessarily stop once you have a diagnosis, because then it's maybe about fighting to access the right support, or fighting to, um, for your children to be able to go into the school that they need to go to. 
Also, there is a lack of awareness and information about rare conditions. And what that means is having to explain your condition sometimes over and over, having to explain how the condition impacts you. Perhaps, for example, in Mary's presentation, when we were looking at accessing benefits, it might be having to kind of very much break down how the condition impacts you. And so we're thinking about the impact of that. And that can be very frustrating and distressing, particularly if you're having to do that in a non-medical setting, because also then it's about dealing with how others respond, which can sometimes be very supportive, but also sometimes feel quite disappointing. A diagnosis of NF can bring worries about the future, perhaps about how the condition might impact over time, what treatment options are available, or what treatment options might be needed. A diagnosis can also impact on our sense of self or identity, perhaps wondering, what does this mean now? Uh, it may also impact family life, so impact dynamics within the family, impact relationships, relationships within the family, but also to extended family. You may find yourself having to manage different needs between uh, the needs of your children who have the condition and those that don't. And then there are also the logistics of day to day. We know that living with a rare condition has massive logistical and financial impact. And I think many of these were addressed in Mary's talks. But I think it's just, again, about reinforcing that all of these things impact our emotional well-being. So I just want to share 12 sort of common feelings that have been shared through our counselling services. And this list is by no means exhaustive. And really, I just wanted to put these words up there to show that there's no one way to feel about diagnosis and that these feelings may change over time, may be exacerbated depending on what's going on in your life or which life stage you're at. And I just would like you to think about whether you recognise any of these feelings, whether these sort of resonate with you at all. And maybe that some of these feelings are harder to accept than others, and maybe harder to sit with. But I think the important thing to remember is that these are all natural feelings to have. There's no, again, there's no right or wrong way. If there's one thing that you take away from today's talk, I hope that it's this, that actually a lot of energy is spent trying not to feel a certain way or feeling bad about a feeling that we might have. Those feelings that we saw that, as I said, might be kind of difficult to sit with. But actually, if we're able to recognise that those feelings move more quickly if we can look at them and accept them rather than try to fight them. So this is about sort of accepting what I call the kind of difficult stuff. So. One, the first step is to, as I say, notice and try and name that feeling. Notice, I'm feeling anxious right now. I'm feeling angry. I'm, I'm feeling envy towards what I'm seeing. Trying to name it. And then the most important thing is to not judge that feeling and not judge yourself for having it. Being kind towards yourself. And then think about what might help. What might you need in this moment? Do you need to talk to a friend, talk to your partner? Perhaps uh, walk outside, getting some fresh air, exercise might be nice. Or maybe it's about finding a way to distract yourself through music or writing, and then learning to let that feeling pass or reduce. And after that, to notice what is it, or who is it, that actually helped when this feeling was visiting. And remember, feelings do visit, they ebb and flow. 
it is unlikely that you will feel the same way for an extended period of time. These things move. So bearing that in mind, um, and I think the little cartoon is just kind of showing it's called what's called the struggle switch. So on the one side is someone where the struggle switch is on, and they are struggling with anxiety and not wanting this anxiety and trying to fight it and using lots of energy to try and fight it. And on the other side, the switch is off. The, the little cartoon is accepting that this is anxiety, that they do not like it or want it, but they're not going to fight it because it's a natural emotion to be experiencing, considering the context. So another sort of helpful image is, is the stress bucket. Um, so it's a sort of metaphor for the internal container that we all possess that kind of determines our capacity to deal with stresses. So we've called it a stress bucket because it's a good way to think about a container that kind of fills up and can be emptied as well. So things fill your bucket add water to it. And these things are everything. They can be day-to-day -day things like, um, thank you, like kind of making sure you get kids to school on time, getting the bills paid, you know, just general kind of things that add to our everyday stress. But then there are also bigger things like a global pandemic, cost of living crisis. All these things add to our bucket and add to it in different quantities. You, you can sort of make less space in the bucket by engaging in self-care, but unfortunately, you can't control how much space certain things will take. And when the bucket becomes too full or overflows, that's when you might experience feelings of overwhelm. You might feel, this is all too much. And I think one of the main things to bear in mind and as sort of illustrated in this graphic, is that the experience of living with NF, and when I say living with NF, that is as a, as a patient, but also possibly as a partner, is that part of your bucket will always have space taken up by this. And that amount of space may increase if you're in a particular, you know, if you're having to make a difficult decision around treatments, or if you're um, you know, experiencing a lot of pain. So when we think that our bucket is getting more full or taking up more space by an F, then we need to be mindful about what is coming into the bucket, what is topping up our bucket. And that's when it's, we have to try and manage what tops up our bucket by sometimes learning to say no, by being able to reduce the stresses that we can control. So just quickly, um, as I mentioned, when our bucket gets too full, we, we, we get a sense of overwhelm, or some might call it a sort of emotional burnout. And there are signs that can help us identify when this is happening, because sometimes we're not very good at noticing these things in ourselves. But these are just some of the signs, and I'm not going to go through them all, um, but I hope you can just have a quick look and see if this is something, if you recognize any of these within yourself, or uh, maybe you have your own signs that you're aware of, but things like noticing that you're getting more irritable than usual, you're kind of snapping, your you know, patience is not there, or maybe your sleep has been affected, you're not able to sleep through the night where before you sleep fine, or perhaps you're avoiding certain situations or people that normally you would enjoy uh, engaging with, and now you just feel that it's too much. So these are things to bear in mind. And obviously, if you recognize these signs in yourself, it might be time to think about trying to empty some of that bucket. So what helps? So I've already spoken about the importance of accepting our feelings and not judging ourselves for having them. But also, it's important to develop muscles for uncertainty or practicing living with uncertainty. And this is done so by staying in the present, um, not, not trying to project too far into the future, because thinking about the future can sometimes be very anxiety provoking. Trying to find and build support networks, and this is friends and family, but also trying to create 
uh, support network with your healthcare professionals and social care. And we recognise that sometimes it's a work in progress, these relationships. Uh, social media is also a good source of support, but again, try not to sort of overdo it because engaging with all that content can also sometimes uh, create more anxiety. And just quickly again, kind of being com kind and compassionate to yourself. And I think one thing as well that I'm really struck by today by everyone in the room and, and those that have tuned in is that to remember that you're not alone, to just look around the room and know that others may be experiencing similar things to you and that you have a community that you can share with. And sometimes it's important to also know when to ask for help. And again, this is the part where I said it's very UK specific, but I think it's kind of helpful to think about whether there's an equivalent in your own country. But there are places that you can access support, such as talking therapies, um, asking your GP, speaking to your hospital teams. It sounds like the team at Guys has quite a good setup. Um, there is also a service called IAPT. Um, I think the main thing to point out, which is UK specific but probably worldwide, is that unfortunately it's very dependent on where you live in terms of what you can access and how good the support will be locally. Um, but there are obviously patient advocacy organisations that provide specialist services and can signpost you to other sources of support. For example, CTT, Childhood Tumor Trust and the Counselling Service, Nerve Tumors UK, Helpline and Rare Minds, our organisation as well. If possible, and, and you feel could be helpful, uh, private therapy is also an option. And here we would encourage you to find a therapist that has experience working with long-term health conditions. It's very unlikely that they will have experience in rare conditions and specifically NF, but they may be able to uh, support you anyway. And Rare Minds is also available to help guide kind of how to find an appropriate uh, therapist. Don't forget about crisis support services like Samaritans, which provide really good listening support. And sometimes it's just about having someone that will listen to you without judgment. And more importantly, don't give up. If you feel that you want help, professional help, and you're coming across barriers or you're coming across professionals or services that don't feel appropriate, don't, please don't give up. Um, that there will be the right help out there. And I think, oh, so if I can just quickly share this, uh, this is just some feedback from uh, uh, people that have attended our workshops and that have used our counselling service. And I just wanted to share these words because obviously these are words of patients and parents like yourself. Meeting, um, this is feedback of what's been helpful within these uh, uh, services. Meeting other parents with children with NF, understanding we all feel the same and are not alone. This was shared by a workshop attendee. And then a parent of a child with NF shared this about our counselling service. Just to say that I'm incredibly grateful and that having the space and the time to talk about my feelings with somebody who is neutral yet knowledgeable about my son's condition has been life-changing. <laughs> 